Well, good morning. Good morning. Mel, could I ask you to pray for us, please? Good gracious Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that uh, Don's leading your Sunday school, and we pray that we adhere to his, uh, what he has, excuse me, what his message will be, and that will be good for our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in the Old Testament to the book of Exodus, chapter 15, we'll read the first 18 verses. Have you noticed anything so far in our study? Anything stand out to you or is it, hmm? Everything's Old Testament. That's where God reveals himself, is in the Old Testament. Follow along, please. Beginning in verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemies in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. You know how hard it is to do this when somebody's tugging on your underwear? There you go. Thank you. (laughs) The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall upon this. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone till your people pass over, O Lord. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. It is one of the loftiest descriptions of the majesty of God in all of the scripture. This is the song of Moses after God delivered the people from the hand of the Egyptians. This is the first song recorded in Scripture, and it looks back at what God had done for his people in the past, as well as what he's going to do for them in the future. And the Bible refers to this song whenever God promises mercy to his people. In Revelation 15, at the end, after God has eliminated all of his enemies, and delivered his people one last time, they sing this song. By the way, 
You're all familiar with Handel's Messiah and Hallelujah Chorus. It's always sung at Christmas and Easter. But do you know where in the narrative of Messiah it comes? When God punishes his enemies in hell, heaven sings that song. It takes a little bit out of the resurrection song, which is where everybody thinks that it, it should come. But that's when heaven sings hallelujah is when God vindicates his honor and you by punishing his enemies in hell. Heaven sings hallelujah. Now this song consists of a preface, verse 1, I will sing to the Lord. Uh, narration in verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. In verse 6, God gets all the credit. Your hand O Lord, has become glorious. Your right hand has dashed the enemy. The, anim the manner of this deliverance is in verse 8. With a blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. In verse 9, he shows how God overrode the enemy's plans. Here's all the things the enemy said they will do. I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. In verse 10, God in response says, You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead. I mean, if that isn't an in-your-face statement, I don't know what is. And then in verses 12 to 18, he describes the impact this had on the nations, the ones the Israelites were going to pass through. But in the midst of this historical narrative, Moses, who seems to be in total ecstasy, breaks out in a stately exaltation of God. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, glorious or majestic in holiness. Now that comes to us in the form of a question, but you know it's not a question. It's like when you ask your kid, did you clean your room? You know, you weren't asking a question. You know they didn't, and you're giving them a chance to get in trouble. <clears throat> but in Scripture, questions are often the strongest possible affirmations or negations. And this is a strong affirmation of the incomparableness of God. And the reason none can be compared to him is because of his holiness. You think in Revelation of the perfect angels who live in God's presence. They have to hide their faces. If that's the response of the perfect angels in heaven, what possible response could sinful creatures like us have other than to prostrate ourselves and cover as much of our sinfulness as we can. Now notice the four things that set God apart from everyone else. There's none like the Lord. He's glorious in holiness. He's awesome in praises, and he works wonders. We're only going to look at the first two because of time. There's none like God. The first expression of the glory of God, there's nobody like him. In fact, we often see God basking in this expression of his glory. I'm just going to throw some verses at you. If you want to write this scripture down, you can look them up later. First Chronicles 17, 20. O Lord, there is none like you, neither is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Psalm 86, 8. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. Psalm 89, 6. For who in heaven can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? And it's upon this very same ground that the Holy Spirit demands that everyone honor God because there's none like him. And then what follows in verse 9 of Psalm 86, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you because there's nobody like him. Now, in our text in Exodus, where it says there's none like the Lord among the gods, it could also be translated among the mighty ones. So whoever or whatever is mighty and great, God is infinitely more great. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so to speak. It follows, then, that there is none to be worshipped as the Lord. There's none to be honored as the Lord. In fact, he demands a universal worship and obedience. We are to worship the Lord our God with what? 
all, that word is so important, all our soul, all our might, all our strength, all our heart. It's a story told of Martin Luther, you know, before he went into the priesthood, he studied to be a lawyer. So he thought like a lawyer. I don't know if that means he was annoying, but he had a logical mind. <clears throat> so they were sitting around having a bull session, which is what seminarians do so often. <clears throat> and the question came up, what is the greatest sin? Brother Ralph, what do you say? Well, uh, I think the greatest sin would be to uh, commit adultery because God is a faithful God, and to commit adultery would be to un be unfaithful. Okay, Brother Fred, what do you say? Well, I think murder would be the greatest sin, because if we're created in the image and likeness of God, to kill someone would be to kill someone made in God's image. So everybody goes around. So it's a typical Bible study today. You read a verse, and then everybody says, here's what I think, as if that matters. <clears throat> they get to Luther. Brother Luther, what do you say? Well, if the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, I guess the greatest transgression would be to love him with anything less than all. Wow. That's a thinker for you. There's none like God in the excellence of his nature. There's none like God in the majesty of his holiness. There is none like him who is worthy to be praised. And that's what we're going to look at in this class, that God is glorious in holiness. That explains the second, because if there's none like him who's glorious in holiness, there's none like him who's worthy to be praised. It's the holiness of God that gives him his infinite worth. Now, the idea of holiness is that of being set apart from a common use to a sacred use. It's much more than just purity. We hallow something, or we make holy the name of God when we don't use it in a crass, profane way, but rather in a sacred and reverential way. You think of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, it's the next word, hallowed, which means made holy. May your name be made holy. How interesting what Jesus said when he went to prayer as opposed to what most of us say when we go to prayer. What's the first thing you think of? Usually, for most people, it's petition. For Jesus, here's was his petition. Father, may your name be treated as holy. I mean, wouldn't we be totally different Christians if there was nothing that was more important to us than that the name of God be honored and treated as holy? And yet something happens, and for so many people, unfortunately for even professing Christians, oh my God! Or even if it's OMG. We know what you mean. Oh, God! In my youth, I used to work volunteer for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I was a football coach at the time. I know I look like a basketball coach. Actually, I look like the basketball itself. And uh, one summer, I went to uh, Minnesota to do a camp at St. Olaf's College. And the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes would often have famous coaches or players or things like that to come up and give a testimony or to lead a group of some kind. Uh, because, obviously, if that guy thinks Jesus is cool, I should too. Well, one of the men that was there this week was a man named Bill Kreischer. Bill had played football at Oklahoma and then was an all-pro for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was a block of granite. Might, might have been 6'1 tops in heels and went about 300 pounds. 
but not fat. He was just mm, big guy. Well, after the uh, camp is over, we go back to the Minneapolis airport, and uh, Bill's taking a plane back to where he lived, and I was taking a plane wherever I lived. And we stop in at one of those uh, little shops they have with magazines, candy bars, mementos, and things like that. And uh, we get in line, and uh, there's a guy in front of us in a suit, and he reaches into the candy thing, and he pulls out a Snickers bar, and he puts it on the, on the counter. He says, how much for this? And she goes, $4. I don't remember what it was, but it was some outrageous amount for a candy bar. And he steps back, and he goes, $4? Jesus Christ, lady, are you kidding? And he hadn't got the sentence out of his mouth. Then Bill grabbed him by the shoulders, turned him around, lifted him off the ground, and was shaking him. Jesus Christ, that's my Savior. I guess you know him the way you used his name. Well, you can imagine, this poor guy, he turned to ash, and he dropped his money, his Snickers bar. Bill put him down, he ran out of the thing. Bill wasn't about to let him do that. And yet we'll let people do that. You wouldn't let him do it to your wife. Why would you let him do it to your God? You want to stand out as a Christian? Start standing up for God's name when it's used in a crass, profane way. You don't have to use the word damn after it for it to be crass and profane. God's holiness is his total otherness from us. God is totally other than we are. Uh, I love this verse in Psalm 50, verse 21, where God says to the wicked, you thought I was just like you. God's not like us. Unfortunately, we're not like him either. We define things by their negation of his character. God is righteous. We are unrighteous. God is holy. We are unholy. In fact, Revelation 15.4 says that God alone is holy. Even the heavens are not pure in his sight, we're told in Job 15, and he charges his angels with folly. Now, compared to God, the very heaven and the angels that inhabit them are not pure. But we know they couldn't be in heaven if they weren't pure. It's just that compared to God, they're not. In Scripture, God is called the Holy One, the Holy One of Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. In fact, He's called holy more times than He is called almighty. But that's what makes Him to be God. And it's not just one thing. Holiness is not just one thing. It is the sum total of all of His other attributes. What God is, no man can be. For example, God is self-existent. God's eternal. He's infinite. That's going to be the lesson next week. I'll be out of town, but uh, someone else is filling in on the greatness of God, that he is infinite. He has all the power and authority there is to have. He's infinitely wise. As we saw last week, God is faithful. He can never change. And since no man can make those claims about himself, God is obviously totally other than we are. And the sum total of all those things is what makes God holy. I mean, if you took away God's holiness, he wouldn't be what he is. His power would be oppression. His wisdom would be manipulation. His sovereignty would be tyranny. His justice would be cruelty. His mercy would be foolish pity. And his truth would be falsehood. Falsehood. Now, God is majestic in all of his attributes and in all of his works, and there's not one thing that's more than another. But God speaks to us according to our understandings, and so it seems like this one stands out above all the rest. But really, it is all the rest. We're to glory in God as a holy God because God glories in himself for that reason. And because he is holy, we're to glory in him and to praise him for it. Psalm 99.3, let them praise your great and terrible name, for it is holy. 
Same Psalm, verse 5, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Just think about those two statements. Anything click in your mind? Why are they worshiping him? For what he is, not for what he does. How many of us would be out the door if God didn't do anything for us? He just was what he is. The angels in heaven look on God and his holiness and they especially exalt him because of this. You know, in Isaiah chapter 6, the cherubim and seraphim cry out three times, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Puritan Stephen Charnock points out that you will never find any of God's other attributes mentioned in this way. God is infinite in power and wisdom, but you never hear the scripture say God is wise, 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 or God is almighty, 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 but God is holy, holy, holy. In Revelation 4, that's what makes the church to cry out. So, it's obvious that in heaven, we will adore God's holiness above any other attribute. Why not start now? Why is it that when you tell me what God is like, God is love, why is that the first thing that comes to mind? Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. The scripture calls heaven the habitation of God's glory, but his glory is the holiness of God. The throne of God is his holiness, Psalm 47, 8. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. Leviticus 10.3, God kills Nadab and Abihu for offering strange fire that he had not commanded them. Jeremiah Burroughs wrote a magnificent work called Gospel Worship. And in that book, he talks about that narrative in Leviticus 10 that God killed Nadab and Abihu for offering strange fire, which the Lord had not commanded them. And he points out, they didn't do something God had commanded them not to do. They did something he hadn't commanded them to do. And that's why the Puritans believe so strongly in the regulative principle of worship. We will only do in worship what God has commanded us to do. Because that's the only way we know that that's what he wants. If we do anything because we do it because we like it, that's what they call will worship. But then who are we really worshiping? Us. We sing songs sometimes that are doctrinally unsound. I mentioned one last week where we sing, we have God dying. That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. God can't die. Why would we say that? Well, but the hymn writer, I don't care what he meant. I know what he said. And you don't sing, you're not praising God when you're singing error. He says to Nay about killing Nadab and Abihu, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. The great business for which the Son of God came into the world was to redeem a people to himself to serve him in holiness. That's why God can never lower his standards, because nothing is more dear to God than his own holiness. God's glory is dearer to him than your soul or your eternal state is to you. Now, in the negative sense, the holiness of God is his perfect freedom from any and all evil. That's why I, I say this every chance I get. People talk about heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven. I want to see grandma. I can't wait to get to heaven because then there won't be any more sin. I want to recommend to you as highly as I can 
that you get this two CD set called Hymns Triumphant. It is over two hours of about 72 different great hymns sung with a full London Philharmonic Choir and London Philharmonic Orchestra behind them. And it is majestic. And it is the greatest tool I know for preparing to come to church and thinking about God the whole time. Instead of listening to the latest thing, here's what Biden did now. How is that helpful to get ready for worship? Unless you're praying praying in precatory psalms or something. But this is just wonderful. And uh, most of the hymns are really, really very good. Um, But the focus is God, not me. And that's a good focus to have, right? But that will be the focus in heaven. It'll be God and Christ. The holiness of God is the integrity of his nature and his will. So his law then is simply an expression of his nature and his will. His law, by his law, he wills conformity to himself. His law expresses that conformity. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why not? Because I am a faithful God. And when you commit adultery, you're being unfaithful. And you're telling people lies about my character. We dishonor God's nature when we charge his law with over-severity. We're saying God is too holy, and I don't like that. But Paul says about the law, it is holy and just and good. Why? Because the God who gave it is holy and just and good. All of God's laws, therefore, are right because he can do no wrong. And all of his laws are right because there's no one greater than God to impose a greater standard. Now, whatever God is, he must be infinitely so. So God is holy. In fact, he is infinitely holy. It's therefore infinitely holy in God to infinitely love himself supremely. God must love that which is infinitely pure. Because love is to that which is lovely. And there's nothing more lovely than infinite purity. God can love himself infinitely because he has an infinite knowledge of himself. You can't love something any more than you know it. And knowing himself completely, he must of necessity love himself completely because he sees the infinite beauty in himself. Therefore, God must infinitely hate that which is contrary to his own infinite purity. A love of holiness cannot exist without a hatred of everything contrary to it. And the more love God has for himself, the more repugnant he must find those things that are contrary to himself. Or let me put it this way. If God did not infinitely hate sin and sinners, he'd be infinitely hating himself. It's the holiness of God that makes God so happy because holiness and happiness are inseparable. All the Beatitudes, blessed. I don't know why we make that a two-syllable word, blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart, or if you will, literally, happy are the holy. God is happy in himself and with himself, and it's because so holy in, in himself. As holy as God is, that's how happy God is. That give you an idea? Therefore, God could never be unhappy unless he were to become unholy. Now, we're going to do a whole section on the God is love a few weeks down the road. But God so completely loves himself and his holiness that he is so willing that his own son should die a disgraceful death on the cross and be exposed to his infinite wrath rather than that sin should live and his holiness remain disparaged by the violations of his law. But that was the expression of his love for himself. And while we rightly say that God never showed his anger and hatred of sin more than when he inflicted infinite wrath on his own son, 
We must also say that God never showed his love for himself more than when he inflicted infinite wrath on his own son. You see, God's love for himself and his wrath, two sides of the same coin. Now, the holiness of God is a death blow to antinomianism. You know what that is? Go ahead, define it for us. Yeah, anti is obviously against, right? Namas is law. Antinomianism means you're against the law. Not the speeding law, which obviously we all are, but against God's law. And there are people out there using up air. You don't have to obey God. God's law was for the Old Testament. Now we're under grace. Not under law. That's what Paul said. We're not under law as a way of getting saved. But Jesus said, if you love me, what will you do? Keep my commandments. Those are laws. What is God's Spirit called? The Holy Spirit. And if that spirit resides within us, he'll make us progressively holy. So the idea of a, quote, carnal Christian is a complete falsehood and a biblical impossibility. Paul said, I have to speak to you as if you were carnal. He didn't say, I'm speaking to you because you're carnal. Now here's the application of all of this. If we say that we worship a holy God, our worship must be holy worship. Again, what does the word holy mean? Other. Set apart from the common and ordinary. Our worship must be suitable to the object of our worship. Not suitable to the worshiper suitable to the object of our worship. And if our God is set apart from the common and profane, our worship better be different from the common and profane. When we come into the sanctuary, the scripture says we come unto his holy temple. That being the case, whatever goes on in that holy temple must itself be holy. In other words, our worship has to be something different. Something set apart from the common or ordinary. It must be sacred and worthy of a holy God. Many years ago, I was a high school teacher and coach in Southern California. And the uh, Youth for Christ people, young, young Life, I think they were called in. Or Campus Life or something. No, they were just Youth for Christ. It was okay to say Christ. <laughs> But they did a Saturday night uh, event at the local community college uh, for the teenagers. And John MacArthur was to be the main speaker. Uh, I've been friends with John for over 50 years now. But I hadn't seen him in a while, so I went back and we were talking backstage. And the, uh, at that time, Jesus music was the big thing. And this band was out there playing their music so loud it hurt my ears. And just, rah, rah, Jesus, Jesus. And the kids were all going, oh, yeah, oh, this is great. <laughs> well, then uh, it came time for John to speak. And uh, so he got up and walked to the front of the stage. And I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw, uh, most of you are old enough to remember hippies. This kid was a hippie. Long hair, tie-dyed t-shirt, holes in the jeans. Oh, wait a minute, that could be today. And he started to go out the door. So I went over to him, and I I took him by the arm. I said, wait, my friend's about to speak. Don't you want to hear what he has to say? I'll never forget this kid's words. I can get this stuff anywhere. I was hoping you Christians had something different. Wow. You know, the world is better at that stuff than we are. 
And when we try to imitate the world in our worship, they laugh at us because they do a better job of it than we do. People should come here for something different. Next weekend, I'm going to Dallas, Texas. I'll be preaching Sunday morning. But uh, Saturday, I'm going to hear a, a singing group called the Vocal Majority. It's 160 men who sing a lot of a cappella music. You can imagine how powerful 160 voices are. They got tons of stuff on YouTube. Just look them up. Their rendition of How Great Thou Art is stirring. Um, and uh, a year ago, I went to their spring show. I go to their Christmas shows and now their spring shows. This is their 50th anniversary, so it's a celebration of 50 years. And uh, I asked to address the group before their rehearsal. And I said, you know, people go to church, they don't remember what you say, but they'll remember how they were treated. And if you guys were a church, there'd never be an empty seat. I mean, it's a wonderfully loving group of men. And I said, I'll tell you why I like this group so much. Because the world is nuts. There's hatred, vitriol, every negative emotion out there. The reason I come to your shows is because for two hours, this is a refuge where everything is positive and uplifting and it's medicine for the soul. That's what church should be, medicine for the soul. In fact, the Puritans called the church worship service a little taste of heaven. And our worship must be sacred and worthy of a holy God. The word worship comes from two old English words, worth, sipe, S-C-I-P-E, put them together, worship. But it literally means homage given to a superior based on his worthiness to receive it. You know what this worship service will be at 1030? This is your opportunity once a week to let God know how much you think he's worth to you. How are we doing? If you were God, how much would you think you were worth based on how you treat him? That makes me want to cry. I often go down to Medellin, Colombia to teach at a seminary there, and I always preach. There's a wonderful Reformed Baptist church there. <clears throat> and the thing about the people in Colombia, how they sing, they sing in public worship as if they're afraid the rest of the city won't hear them. And then you come to a typical Christian church in America and the people sing as if they're afraid the guy standing next to them might hear them. How great would God think he is based on how we sing? How great would God think he is based on just good manners, like being on time for church? When my daughter was growing up, I found a thing on the internet, rules to date my daughter. Magnificent. And it's to be given to the young man. If you pull up in front of the house and honk, you better be delivering a pizza because you're sure not picking up my daughter. And if your pants are down around your ankles, don't even bother knocking. If that's true, how much more true should it be of God? I mean, the angels aren't called holy for applauding His purity, but for conforming to it. So how do we most worship this holy God? By singing praise choruses? I... I'm so upset with these contemporary churches that uh, say, now we're going to have the praise time, and then comes the sermon. As if praise was only what we do in singing. By clapping our hands, 
by doing what pleases us. No, we most worship God by imitation. We worship God when our worship is befitting His character. It needs to be suitable to His nature. If God is lofty and exalted, as Isaiah tells us, then our worship of Him must be lofty and exalted. It can't be common, ordinary day and drawn from the air. And if it's not, then it's not God we're worshiping. We're just worshiping ourselves. Remember the old show with Dick Clark, American Bandstand? And every now and then he'd want to try out a new song. <clears throat> and he'd have a panel of teenagers. And after they'd hear this new song, he'd say, Okay, what'd you think? Well, I give it a four because it's got a good beat and it's easy to dance to. Isn't that what so many people do with worship? Why do we sing that song? Well, because uh, it pleases me. Did it please God? The issue is not, were we pleased with worship? The issue has to be, was God pleased with my worship? What if every day we walked out of here, God handed us a sign with a number, how he rated our worship? I give it a two. If God is glorious, our worship must be glorious. We sing the song, pavilioned in splendor, then our worship has to be splendid worship. Remember, our worship tells God what we think he is and how sobering that is. A holy God deserves and demands a holy worship. In fact, that's all he will accept. In Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace. Okay, we're to have grace. And what do we do if we have grace? By which we may serve God acceptably. The word serve there in the Greek is the Greek word letrueo. It means to do homage, literally to worship. If we have grace, we're to worship God. But what makes that worship acceptable? With reverence and godly fear. If we worship God with reverence and godly fear, our worship is acceptable to Him. Now, what's the conclusion we should draw? If we don't worship God with reverence and godly fear, our worship is unacceptable. It's rejected. It's not worthy of God. In Amos, it says God looks at the worship of the people he covers his eyes, he covers his ears, and he holds his nose. Could he be any more graphic than that? I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. It stinks. What an indictment. That's why I love this church. Because we have dignified, reverent, godly, fearing worship. It's focused on God, not the audience. My friends, whatever the world may think of God, at least let his own people declare his worth to him. Amen? And now let's go do that. Let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, these are tough words, but they are your words. And may we take them to heart and strive to present to you worship that's acceptable and pleasing and worthy of you. For the honor of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.